All of my wisdom came mm -hmm. from all the toughest days. I never learned a thing being happy. And all of my suffering came. I didn't appreciate it. I never learned a thing being happy. I'm about to know how it feels now and then. I got a happiness Jones, my friend. Yeah, it's a happiness Jones. All of my answers came.
guys uh welcome to the live stream for jam in the van we're gonna dissect another mix today it's brought to you by owc so uh i hope you guys enjoyed that song by uh the wood brothers uh happiness jones and a little bit of ex express yourself so it was a really fun track to mix and now we're going to kind of dissect and go through everything the first thing i wanted to point out in that track again phenomenal band in the van like just the level of what they were doing was above the top you notice the drummer also was playing keyboards with his uh it would have been his right hand while still playing drums so now what we're going to do last time we actually kind of built a mix from the bottom and put it to the you know to where we'd get something to release now i'm actually taking the mix that we already did this is the exact same mix that you just heard and i'm going to kind of go through and dissect some of the different things that we ended up doing on it so let's start again and we'll just kind of find a little area to kind of start digging into some deeper things i want to really go into effects today also limiting and mastering uh your tracks when it comes to releasing for jam in the van and other things like that so uh, here we go i'm gonna play it again kind of the hook of where this is at all of my answers came driving myself insane I'm a spark of light to get happy That old dragon When he comes back mad I got a happiness show So bad Yeah, happiness too Okay, so that's a little area that I want to kind of look at, and then we're going to go into what I've done for everything for all the different tracks. So in the last Dissecting the Mix, I kind of showed you building up from the bottom of EQ to compression to uh, going on to the next level. Now I'm going to show you what the actual mix was. So on the kick, hold on one second. On the kick, I actually had three different EQs, a couple different compressors, a max bass, transient designer and a limiter so i'm going to go through and i'm going to actually bypass everything so let me do that real quick and i'm going to play what the kick sounds like by itself so as you can see it's not really a, a full sound so i kind of end up needing to beef this up quite a bit to kind of get it to where we want it to ultimately be so let's start looking at some of the eqs that i had on there so this is kind of the first eq that i will normally do uh, something like this i'm going to carve out some sort of mid-range a lot of people always used to say around 400 hertz for the kick i, I don't go with specific frequencies that i'm going to carve out i, I kind of do it by listening in in the room and seeing what I want to do. Uh, one thing I also did is I boosted right around 125. This is actually 124, a small little peak you see right there. 
And what I found with this frequency especially is that it helps it cut through on smaller speakers. And now when I'm listening to my big Adams or the NS10s, I can hear it fine. But when I switch to my Aurotones, I'll do that right now, it, it's not quite as prevalent. But when I boost right here, oh. So now I find that right there, it just gives it a little bit of an attack and it really kind of helps it cut through the entire mix once we'll bring everything back in. So this is kind of my first round of EQing. And then again, I'm gonna do some more. And then the second one, I'm really finding that this is lacking a lot of low end. Uh, I, I believe as we talked in the last one, uh, an important thing when you're deciding where you want the energy to come from is the kick or the bass. And in this specific, uh, genre I'm actually going to decide to have it come more from the kick than the bass so we have to decide where we really want the energy to come from so I'm boosting around 75 hertz a lot about 5 dB so let's hear it with and without and then again normally my last EQ will just be very very minor things of what I want to do, I actually ended up bringing up, I found I was EQing out a little bit too much mid-range, so I brought up a little bit more. Next, we're going to go to compression. Uh, as I've talked about this in the past, I always like to do multiple layers of compression. So I'm going to use a CLA 76, it's an 1176 clone, and we're going to do about three decibels of gain reduction. Same thing, I also do the same thing. I add another compressor. I love the LA3A clone, and I'm going to do about two decibels of gain reduction. So we're bringing this kind of back up into the, into the hole to the level that I would want it at. So now it's still lacking a little bit of kind of low end of what I really want. So one plugin that I always find that, that I end up loving using, especially on kicks and even bass and other things like that, I've actually used it also on guitars uh, and uh, acoustic guitars. Everything that's lacking low end is max bass. So I have it here set, and you're going to hear kind of the woofiness of the kick really come up, which is going to be the level that I want it at. So now I like kind of where that low end energy with the kick is sitting. It, it has a good amount, but it's a little bit too, the length of it is a little bit too much. So my Swiss Army Knife plugin that I use pretty much on everything, I've used it on everything from drums to vocals, I, I recently used it on uh, a vocal track, is the SPL Transient Designer. Now with this Transient Designer, if, if people aren't familiar with, I can alter the attack and the sustain separately. So what I always end up doing is dialing back the sustain and boosting up the attack. So a lot of times I'll dial back the, the sustain of the kick to make sure the length is to where I want it to be in context, especially with the bass. So let's do that real quick. So you can hear like how it just kind of tightens it all up when I add the transient designer. I'll do it one more time. I'm going to actually add the bass in. So you're going to hear kind of the dichotomy of what happens without it and when it's in. So this is without. Great, so that kind of tightens everything up to where I want it to be. The last thing that I'll do is I'm gonna add a limiter. Now this is just to kind of get it up to the level. I typically always have my kick and snare at right at my, minus six dB for the output ce uh, ceiling of digital zero. So when I find that I do that and I have the kick and the snare and then I kind of balance everything back up to that, once I do that, I find I have enough headroom when it comes to mastering, which we'll get to in a little bit. 
So let's put that on. Okay, so now same thing. So now we're gonna go down, we're gonna look at the snare and the overhead. So once I have the kick, again, I like to have it at minus six dB uh, below digital zero. And then I'll start building everything up with that. So let's go to the snare and the same thing. I'm gonna bypass everything and then I'm gonna add it back in. Abby, Abby. So very much kind of a very boxy sound when it comes to the snare. So same thing, I'm gonna kind of start carving out some of the mid range, bringing up a little bit of the low end and the high end and bringing it back up. It's, it's a very similar chain that I have. I have two EQs, I actually have a trim plugin to go into the LA-76 and then LA-76 to LA-3A transient designer limiter. So let's bring these up and take a look. Same thing with the LA-76. I'll try to have about three decibels on the first one. Okay, now add the LA-3A. And so the same thing as well too. I have a transient designer where I'm carving out a little bit of sustain and bring up the attack just a little bit and then a limiter. Notice that the limiter on it again is just barely touching the transients. It's not slamming it by any means, but I find some people say, well, why are you limiting it? Ultimately, you're gonna be limiting it no matter what on the master bus. So I try to make sure everything is kind of even before it gets to the master bus. So let's take a listen to that. So we've got our kick and snare kind of dialed in. Now with the overheads, these are overheads in the room, and so they're not specifically just over the drums, but I end up kind of treating them like drum overheads, mostly because that's kind of what you're hearing ambient-wise mostly in the room. So I'm gonna bypass everything, and we can hear kind of what's going on at first. Happy, happy. So as you can hear, there are definitely a lot of weird kind of frequencies that are building up in the room just by the essence of having guitar, bass, keyboards, drums, and vocals all at the same time. The first thing that I do is I actually will go through with an imager and kind of try to balance it out in the room with weather position. So let's kind of hear before and after the stereo image. <laughs> So the adjustment I have with the stereo imager is actually bringing it because it's kind of heavy on the left and so I'm balancing it out so I kind of have a, like a center stereo image. And then same thing, we're EQing. Then I'm going to add a compressor. I love the API 2500 for overheads, I've just kind of got to using it a lot. I actually have one here, the analog version but I love using the digital one. It's so much, uh, sometimes it's just quicker to use than to have to plug it in and then print it afterwards. So we're gonna put that in. So it's kinda pretty slappy right now, so I'm gonna actually bring it down with the final EQ. Notice I'm bringing it down 6.5 decibels and I've actually inverted the phase. Now that's not gonna matter right now when you hear it, but it will once the snare pops in. So I'm gonna just hear it by itself. So now the phase compliance, you know, whether something is in phase, especially with drums is very important. So I'm gonna actually put it to the way it was normally and I'm gonna solo the snare as well too. And you're gonna hear uh, you won't hear until I actually invert the phase, but it's actually out of phase. 
So let's hear it now first, kind of when everything is technically in phase, I'm going to have the overheads uh, normal phase. Uh, yes, so we had a quick question from the audience. Uh, do I pan the overheads? Yes, the overheads are panned. Uh, they're actually kind of room mic. So as you can see in this stereo channel, I have them hard left and hard right. So what I actually also end up doing all the time, I am a big advocate of panning really hard when it comes to things. A lot of amateur mixes and things that I hear, they're really not going for it when it comes to pan. So if it's a tom or if it's overheads or something like that, I'm going to go to the extremes to really try to give that, that stereo depth when it comes to it. So I'm going to actually make it mono real quick so you can hear and then hear what happens when I go stereo. So again, this is in Pro Tools. So Pro Tools, it has uh, ranges all the way from 100 to the left, 100 to the right. So most of the time, whenever I get a stereo track, I'm going to make it as far as possible. I'll sh demonstrate what happens when you make it, let's say, at 35 and 35, what sometimes people will do, not quite as hard pans. <laughs> Now I'm going to go all the way up. Okay, so now let's go back to phase compliance between the snare and the, and the overhead. So again, I'm going to isolate these two together, and we're going to hear the snare and what it sounds like out of phase and in phase. So notice when I actually turn it out of phase that it has a fuller sound. That means that the overheads and the snare are actually out of phase. There's another little trick that I'll show you real quick that you can actually see this. So when I zoom in on the waveforms, we're going to zoom in and I'm going to actually bring up the snare a little bit. And we can see the up and the down. So as we see right there, the snare is having, it initially goes down and then up in the waveform. The overheads, there's actually a time delay that it takes to get to the overheads. I can actually see this right here. Let's see how long that is. That's two milliseconds. But in those two milliseconds, you can see, especially right here, that when the uh, waveform is going up, it's going down on the overheads. So that means that it's out of phase. So this is kind of a technique that you want to go through with everything, especially with the overheads and the snare, to see if the snare is in phase or out of phase. So again, I'm going to demonstrate that one more time audibly. So this is out of phase. And this is in phase. Okay, great. So this is us turning the good shit up and the bad shit down, right? Now I'm going to go to the rack tom. That's the last thing that we have in this drum set. He wasn't playing a fuller tom. And this I'm going to go back to panning as well. When it comes to drums, a there's a huge debate on whether or not you should pan it from the audience perspective or the drummer's perspective. I've always been from the audience perspective. I, it's just kind of the way that when I look at it, I want to see the rack tom on the right side and the floor tom on the left side. The, the funny thing is I actually went to school for drums, so I played drums. I don't, even though I played drums and I have the, the rack tom on my left and the floor tom on my right, I always want to do it from visually what I'm seeing. So with that being said, I'll pull up a rack tom hit. We've got a bunch of them right here. And I have it panned all the way to the right, as you can see right here. Okay, so now we're going to go in. Same thing, I'm going to EQ, compress it, add a transient designer, and then limit it to get to the level that I want it at. 
and then add a, another EQ. The last EQ that I brought down, I bring it down just a little bit. And the other thing that I'm doing is notice I, I almost use this EQ mostly for level and then also phase compliance again as well. So I found that this rack time was out of phase with the overhead. So we're going to do it out of phase and in phase. So that's in phase. I'll do it out of phase. And one more time in phase. So now with that being said, a lot of times when I check things, especially if they're hard pan with in phase, I have a collapse mono button on my dangerous monitor ST that I'll monitor everything in mono to check to see whether stuff is in phase or not. So now that we have this, I'm going to go back a little bit and solo all of the drums again. We're going to hear this in context of the mix. Abby, 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 Abby So, great drummer. Now we're going to move on to the bass. A similar thing with the bass. I kind of have a, a typical EQ, and I'm boosting similarly to the kick, but I have to make sure I carve out certain frequencies for both of them. I'm boosting again around, let's see, a small little thing right around 116 hertz that I found kind of helps stick out on my aura tones or on smaller speakers. So I'm going to isolate the bass so you can hear kind of without and with the different um, signal processing that I have on it. Again, you can hear there's actually a lot of low end, so I have a high pass frequency at 45 hertz. So I don't know if you, uh, depending on the speakers you hear, but there's almost a little bit too much that's going to be clouding with the kick. So I'm going to isolate um, both of those, and you can hear what it sounds like with the high pass and with the high pass not in. So this is without the high pass. So it kind of cleans it up. Same thing, adding a couple of compressors. I, I kind of use it a little bit differently. The LA-3A, the reason why I love this, this is kind of like my Swiss Army Knife compressor. It has an attack, a fixed attack, I believe, at 1.5 milliseconds. And then it also has kind of a variable release. So you don't have to kind of mess around with the attack and the release too much. And it just sounds great on everything. I use it on guitars. I use it on bass. And then I'm having an LA-3A, I'm sorry, an LA-2A, that has a very nice warmth to it. It just adds a nice boost in the low end. So let's hear those. Again, guys, notice that I am very slightly hitting the compressors on this. I'm not slamming it. So right now I'm going to show you the, you know, let you guys hear the difference when it's slammed way too much. So you can see on that, like I'm, I'm hitting it maybe about minus 5 to minus 7 dB, and it's just cutting out all the dynamics. Again, we don't want to cut out all the dynamics. We just want to kind of tame it just a little bit. So again, I'm going to bring it back. To Same thing. I, I just always love toning things, uh, tone shaping things with the transient designer. I use the plugin all the time. I've actually got some hardware units of as, w as well. There's nothing like it if you really need to get some attack or kind of dial the sustain just a little bit. So now when it comes to leveling it out, I actually like to have the output ceiling when I limit it, and again, it's very slightly limiting it. I have it about minus 12, depending on the track. I actually have this a little bit more, minus 11.5. Again, this gives me enough headroom 
with everything to kind of get so that I don't slam my master fader before it goes to printing everything. So now we're going to add both of those back in. Great. Now we're going to move to the guitar and the keys. So with the guitar, it, we're using orange amps, uh, great amps in the van. And one thing I always find is I always typically need to boost a little bit of the high end on it. And I actually end up doing a high pass frequency right around 100 hertz just to kind of cut out all that low end that's really not needed because we have it being fixed by the, uh, by the bass and the kick. So now we're going to pull that up. Now, one thing I also want to note is I have it dipped right here at 116 hertz. Why 116 hertz? It's actually where I boosted on the bass. So what I found is that little bit of like kind of a punchiness of the bass is going to help it bring out just a little bit more when it comes to the guitar. So I'm going to actually bring those both up, bypass them, and then I'm going to engage them so you can hear what happens when I add in the bass and then I subtract from the guitar. The clarity of both of them is just going to kind of help it punch through the mix a little bit more. So here's without. And here's with. So moving right down the line again, compress it, and then I have another EQ in there just to kind of bring down the gain or adjust anything that other frequencies that I start hearing in the context. So now we have all of our harmony instruments minus the keys, which as we saw the drummer was playing. So let's hear what all of these sound like. So now let's go to the keys really quickly. So one thing I want to point out that I noticed that I did is I actually ended up muting the keys where they weren't playing. So there's a lot of places where the keys aren't playing, so I actually just ended up muting it. It looks like this key track was actually recorded through an amp. So we're going to isolate that really quick so you can hear what it sounds like. <laughs> So you can hear it's kind of actually at a pretty low level right now of where it was recorded. I think the amp was pretty quiet in the van. So the thing that you have to be careful about when you're recording things like that is the quieter that the amp is, it won't bleed into other things, but the bleed into it will uh, be a lot more. And so because of that, I actually ended up having to, you can actually hear it within the context, there's a lot of low end rumble from the bass and the kick. So what I ended up doing is I added a high pass around 84 hertz and kind of EQ'd it bright, you know, brightened it off a little bit, took out about a little bit of the mid-range. Let's take a listen to that. Same thing. Let's add a compressor and an EQ. Great. So another thing I want to point out, we've not actually had any issues yet with uh, hard drive malfunctions or anything like that because we're using OWC hard drives at Jam in the Van. Everyone uses it for me. All of my internal hard drives and external hard drives are from OWC and also all of the post-production with video and everything like that. We store everything on the flash drives and the rotating drives. They're just very solid hard drives. With the new version of Pro Tools, we can actually go into it and I want to make sure everyone's aware, and this is a very important thing and it works phenomenally well with OWC, is you have a disk playback cache size. So what that actually does is it takes the audio files that are in your session and will load it into the, the RAM. And so it'll take it off the hard drive and make sure you have less use on the hard drive and make sure they last even longer. 
So let's keep moving forward. So now we've got the keys in context of the track too. So now we're going to go to the vocals. Again, as you can see here with these vocals, they're, you know, phenomenal control of their vocals. They they have good waveforms. They're singing very well dynamically balanced within the band. I mean, the Woods Brothers really truly are a band. So we're going to go through and I'm going to now hear the vocal, the lead vocal and then we're going to start EQing it and compressing it and bring it back in. I got a happiness show so bad. Yeah, happiness too. So now let's go through and kind of I'll show you what my typical EQ and compression chain will be for that. So we always use dynamic mics for the lead vocal, which is great, but it has a lot of a proximity effect. I'm actually using a dyma dynamic mic right now. So the closer you are to the mic, the more low end that you're going to get. So I end up having to cut out some of the low end and then actually brightening it up a little bit. So let's go with the first EQ. Now the first EQ in general, and I've been doing this universally, I actually will do a subtractive EQ most of the time. And so I like to do subtractive as opposed to additional EQ. It, it just makes it sound a little bit more natural to my ears. So here is the first EQ. Notice we've got really kind of a wonkiness right around here. It's right around 500 hertz. So we're here with and without. I got a happiness show so bad. Yeah, happiness day. Wow, 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 wow. And same thing, I, th this second EQ is just very slight things. I'm actually adding a little bit of a top end. And then we're going to bring it into a compressor. I love using the API 2500 as my first compressor when it comes to lead vocals. I can kind of slam it a little bit hard. This compressor is very transparent. And by transparent, I mean I can actually compress it more and it doesn't sound compressed. So with this compressor, I can get even up to about maybe six decibels of gain reduction. And I don't noticeably hear any sort of compression. So we're going to put that back in. I got a happiness show so bad. Yeah, happiness too. Again, very transparent compressor. It just sounds great. And then the next thing I will do is I normally will de-S. So every time a vocalist has an S, it's going to be very sibilant. So this is kind of a way to kind of tame that down. So just the middle range of his voice to kind of make it even out a little bit. So the frequency that I'm going to be compressing is right here from 92 hertz to around 601 hertz. That's the thing. So that's the only threshold that I'm going to uh, adjust to EQ it. So I'll bypass it and then I'll put it in. I got a happiness show so bad. So now let's put it in and you can hear it in context. I got a happiness show so bad. Yeah, happiness too. Wow, 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 wow. Again, we're adding just a little bit more compressors to kind of bring it up in the context of the track. And then I have a last EQ on here that I will adjust. Notice I have it just like a half a dB higher to fit in the context of the mix. And the other thing I actually do as well too is I check the phase compliance when it comes to the lead vocal and the drums. So a lot of times you're going to get a little bit of a snare and just kind of some room ambience in the lead vocal in the van. And so I'm going to adjust that to make sure that it sounds phase coherent with the drums. So we're going to play that and I'll show you what it sounds like with it bypassed out of phase and then when I put it in phase. I got a happiness show so bad. Yeah, happiness too. I got a happiness show so bad. Yeah, happiness too. Great, so now I'm going to bring up all of the harmony and then also the lead vocals and the drums and then we get to the background vocals and then we'll move to really quick the first one that i'm going to adjust typically for me is the lead vocal 
And so depending on the style of music, I'm going to decide what type of reverbs that I want to have on there. In my template, I normally have all the different reverbs kind of just ready to go so I can just send it to them and have, uh, I don't have to pull them up every time and like kind of dial in my settings. So with a room verb and like I have a true verb New York plate. So it's the same plugin and I actually have three different reverbs of it. I'll pull those all up. And they're all the same plate, but the difference that I have is the decay time or the length of the reverb. So I have a shorter one at 0.6, and then I have a little bit longer at 1.2, and then an even longer one at 3.8. So it looks like with the lead vocal, I just used the true verb 1 and 2, which is the one at 1.2 and 3.8. So I'm going to pull that up, and you can hear kind of what they start sounding like once I start to add these in. So now what I found is that I will bring up more of a reverb when it's a uh, slower, sorry, uh, the 1.2 I can bring up more in your face, whereas if you bring up the one that's a little bit longer, it just starts to sound washed out too much. So I'm going to demonstrate what it sounds like when you bring up the longer reverb. It, it'll just cut themselves. So it looks like I have room reverbs to kind of really give just a little bit more depth. I'm going to bypass them and then put them in. So that just adds just a little bit of depth in there. And then a true verb. And then I have a longer 3.8 true verb just on the snare. So let's hear those. Okay, next, now let's go to EQing all of the harmony. So a lot of times, one thing that, I, a little trick that I'll do is with the guitar, I will actually add a slap delay on it to the other side to create a nice depth. So with this guitar, I'm painting it all the way to the right, and then I'm using a slap delay all the way to the left. So I'm going to solo that up, and you're going to hear what it sounds like with a So as you can see right here on the master fader, with everything bypassed on my master fader, I still have probably 4 to 5 dB before it's hitting digital zero. This is very important. A lot of people will have their track so high that by the time that it gets to the master fader, it's already peaking. You're not going to get any clarity, any depth of field on the stereo imaging or anything like that. It's way better to actually have headroom before you start limiting and bringing everything down. So the first thing in my mastering chain that I'll do is typically an EQ. This EQ literally has nothing on it right now. All it is is adjusting down the input just a little bit to just make sure that I have enough headroom. So we'll put that in. Happy, 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 happy to stay. And I'm not dithering down or adding anything like that, but I'm just bringing down the threshold now to kind of get it to where it needs to be. So I'm going to put it in. I'm actually having it at minus four, but I'm going to slowly bring it down. You're going to hear what that does. Next limiter that I'll use, I use multiple limiters on my master fader. I love using multiple as opposed to just one. I can then kind of slightly bring it down and not over compress it all at one time. It's a big thing that I'm really into doing is not over compressing, but using multiple compressors, multiple limiters to make it sound as transparent as possible, as loud as possible. So the next one that I love using is the Pro L2. It's made by Fab Filter. Such a great limiter. So when this in, I'm just bringing it down another 1.5 decibels. I highly recommend checking out this limiter. It's uh has not on my peace and quiet. Can't find, put it outside. Yeah, I 
Look out the sparkle light get happy. So as you notice, as it goes on longer, it's actually starting to raise just slightly and slightly. So this one's probably going to be around minus 12 LKFS. So I might bring it up just a little bit more limiting just to kind of make sure it's at the level that I want. But it's very important to use some sort of metering plugin like this to see the LUFS or LKFS level that you're at. There's a bunch of different ones. I love this one. It actually has a great offset to match feature that you can like bring it down to see what will happen what it sounds like in Spotify or Apple iTunes. It's, it's a great plugin to check out. So now that we kind of have everything limited, the last thing that I'll go through is I'm going to go through and I'm going to start automating the different things that need to come up and down. I like to compress and kind of get everything like a bass sound and then I go through and if, if there's something that I want to have brought up or brought down, I'll go in and do that afterwards. So let's see, we're going to pull up the waveforms of everything. And it looks like this was a, a pretty straightforward thing when it comes to automation. But as we can see right here, we have the keyboard solo. I have it at a certain level. And then nextly, we have a, a guitar solo. So with the guitar solo, what I actually ended up doing was I automated the keyboards down and brought the guitar up. So let's hear what this sounds like. I'm going to play it with and without the automation. So I'll first play it without, and then you can hear with automation of kind of bringing stuff up and down. This is a great new feature with digital DAWs that's been around for 20 years, but back in the day you had to manually kind of move things up and down to make sure they wanted to be exactly where they're at. Now we can just kind of write them in. So now with that, you can still kind of hear the keyboards are still out front and the guitar is taking over. So we need to adjust the volume. So I'm going to put in this automation. You can hear what that sounds like. So again, we're bringing the guitar out front because that's the focal point of what the part, this part of the song is, and we're bringing the keys back down. A lot of times when I automate, I'll just mess with the harmony that I need to automate. I typically do not automate or adjust the drums unless I really need to, or the bass. Those are kind of just like a unifying like sound. Everything else, because it's in balance, if it needs to be supported, I'll bring it up, or if it's too overbearing, I'll bring it down. So guys, this is kind of breaking down, again, the Woods Brothers, Happiness Jones, Express Yourself Mix. I hope you guys th uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It was really a lot of fun. And uh, keep coming back. I hope we can do a couple more of these in the future. And I'm going to, again, play you out with a little bit of music. And remember to turn the good shit up and the bad shit down. Peace, guys. All of my answers came. Driving myself insane Yeah, I had a drag in the tank To get happy And all of my peace and quiet Couldn't find blood and I'll fly Yeah, I killed a spark of light To get happy And that old dragon When he comes back, man I got a happiness show so bad Yeah, happiness too Oh